Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Private Property Farming Podcast. My name is Mbali Nwoko, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Today, we have a familiar face once again, Sviston Dombela, Trade Economist with the National Agricultural Marketing Council. And today's topic is all about um, the agricultural landscape once again. It's 2021, it's a new year, and we are just towards the end of the first quarter of the year. So um, Sviso is just going to give us a brief uh, overview of what's been happening in the industry um, with regards to farmers, with regards to trade policies, the African Free Trade Agreement. Um, we're going to be discussing how farmers have been um, operating in this first quarter, the challenges that they experienced, the opportunities that they experienced, etc. So uh, Sviso will just give us a great overview um, so far uh, with regards to what's happening in the agricultural landscape. If you have any questions specifically on our topic tonight, please feel free to ask, um, to, to comment on the live show and ask our guest any questions that you might have. Um, he's quite a knowledgeable individual, so <laughs> I'm quite confident that any question he's able to tackle, so whether it's regarding the African Free Trade Agreement, import and exports, minimum wage, etc., cetera, um, I think this conversation will be quite insightful to many of you who just want to know exactly what happens in the industry. Um, once again, as uh, I always say in the show, is that please like, comment, and share. The podcast um, would be live on YouTube after this live if you missed it. And um, I also encourage you to take part of our Sherlock Holmes competition. We're still in our weeks running. Every single week we announce, a, a, um, we announce the winner. And um, it's all about that riddle. So um, yeah, please look on our social media pages as well as our website just to find out more about this competition. But without further ado, I just want to get straight into our conversation. Sviso, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great, buddy. Thank you very much. And good to be here once again. Absolutely. I'm happy to have you back onto the show because, you know, we need to keep poking geniuses like yourself so that we can educate ourselves about the industry. And um, yeah, so I'm thank you for me. I thank you for making time uh, to be part of uh, this conversation this evening. So let's start off with, um, you know, what's been happening in the first quarter. You know, lockdown restrictions have eased a bit. Um, you know, how are the grain farmers feeling? Um, those that are um, supplying in the brewery sector, we've had a number of rains, um, a lot of rains throughout the country mm -hmm. uh, in January as well as February. And still, I think in the start of this week, I'm, I'm definitely still having, I'm having rains at my farm right now. So um, what's been happening as we are just closing off this first quarter of the year? Yeah, thanks. Um, it, it's really been, I, I think overall, it's been really a good start. I think um, from an agricultural perspective, we, we, we sort of pick continuing from the last momentum we had towards the end of last year. But as you know, uh, as a farmer yourself, it, it, in agriculture, we sort of want the middle ground of it. Too much rain on its own as well becomes a problem yeah. on its own. And I think we, we, at some point we had some very harsh rain that caused some little bit of damages in some of the flat areas across the country. And one of the impact that it also had, it delayed the harvest, particularly in the wine industry. We saw that it is most of the grapes are still being delayed and to a certain extent even our summer fruit were impacted. But I think on the net part of it, and overall I think it has been a very good um, first quarter of the year starting off we we'll expecting really good crop starting to show up in the grain farmers they should again see a very good harvest this year mm -hmm. we'll be expecting the animal industry to continue on their recovery and restocking from the very uh, long period of drought that affected them in the past uh, four to five years so mm -hmm. um and i think in terms of the export front as well we're starting to see those export oriented commodities continue to show a very good fronting we're expecting the citrus industry to continue being our shining star on the mm -hmm. export side, as well as some of the industries such as the table grapes and the mm -hmm. stone fruit. So in overall, we're still hoping that we will continue to be registering positive um, uh, numbers and the overall outlook of the sector is looking positive. 
Right. You know, I always, I always say this to you that I like speaking to economists because you like to forecast things, right? Um, and always look at uh, historical data and obviously project what's going to happen in the future. But w with what's happening in the global economy, I mean, the little that I was able to gather, I think at the start of this week is that a number of European countries are, also, are actually going back into harsh lockdown restrictions. Mm -hmm. So as much as Jan, Feb and March Made it might have been positive with good rains and supposedly maybe also a bit of a, a setback to many other farmers because we couldn't harvest, etc. Um, do you think the next quarter, as you've mentioned, will be that great, seeing that you know a number of European countries are going back to harsher lockdowns? So won't that have uh, a, a ripple effect in the long term, especially in the next quarter or the third quarter of the year? For, for the South African agriculture industry? S certainly, and, and I think for, to, to respond to that question, I think it's a very excellent question you've posed there. We'll have to elevate that beyond agriculture and look at the entire economy. Mm. And we, we seem to, be, because we are integrated in the global um, economic system, and we seem to lack the behavior of these uh, Western countries, and because they are going into this hard lockdown, because, because they are mainly the consumers of our general commodities, whether you're looking at a manufacturing space or whether you're looking at other um, industrial commodities that we tend to export, including even some of our mineral commodities, they go to these industries. So what will happen with their commodity, with their um, reduced consumption because of imposed lockdown, it tends to affect our trade cap uh, capabilities and exchange, you know, not only just on commodities, but also on services because the, the, the movement of persons, especially business persons, tend to be affected. And that has a knock-on effect. And we've already seen the impact of that even in last year, in last year um, uh, second quarter of how impactful it was. And I think to also come back to the domestic market, um, domestic economic side is that some of the commodity, some of the in sectors that were hardly impacted in the previous year, we are likely to see that impact might not be at a very same severe effect than it was last year, but we might start also seeing that recovery that we so dearly expecting being much lower than the V-shaped recovery that we've always in, he expected it in the beginning. And so the tourism industry will start being affected, the trade industry will start being affected, transport system will start being affected, and all that will not bode well in aggregate demand of our commodities, which will have a knock-on impact also on our job numbers um, in the country. Ah, I see. And let's talk about the African Free Trade Agreement. You know, um, it's been implemented, it's been signed off, etc. What type of opportunities currently exist for South African farmers to trade with farmers across the African continent and vice versa? Which commodities are, 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 are seeing a positive in terms of trade or in demand? Um, what could you tell us about the current trade agreement and the opportunities that exist for farmers alike? That that is an exciting uh, development that is happening within the continent. I think um, um, uh, yesterday I was with some of the colleagues also from Tralec, um, Trudy, which they do an excellent job in terms of the negotiation front with different government states in the continent. And I think um, from the positive side of it is that with this free trade agreement era that came in from the first of January this year, it makes it now it reduces at least from the tariff point of view the cost of trading with other African continent. And we are able now to have this single biggest market in the world. If you think of it, that you have 1 billion free trade agreement in the, in the continent now. Mm -hmm. And so South Africa has always been, if you're looking at it with the, its trading partners in the continent, is that we tend to, because we have some industrial capacity to even add uh, value addition into our agricultural products, but also other non-agricultural products. And we think that that will then give that emphasis to our, farm, uh, to our farmers and businesses alike to start trading more freely and more openly with not only with SADC countries, but also with East African countries, with also with Coesa on the Western part up to the North. So we're hoping this is a start of the, the realization of the Cape to Cario dream. Um, I must emphasize as well that the, the, the signing of African trade agreement is just one of the programs that are run by the African Union. We know also that they are as part of the twin, twin agenda 2063 for the African continent to really create this inclusive harmony 
within the um, the, the continent itself. So we, 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 we foresee this bringing more opportunities if we come home from our farmers in the grain space where we're not only just exporting maize, we can also export other commodities within our grain industries. We foreseeing them starting to have an potential to export some of our almond products, particularly those that are processed, as well as our fruit juice and other processed products, such as your um, feed into those animals where they don't have that capacity in that area. Mm. But I must also then do uh, emphasize this to say, while we are very excited and there are tangible opportunities that can really be materialized, not only just as in we seeing Africa as an export destination, but we also see our neighboring countries in the SACU, in the SADC and up north being also a potential to start building these business opportunities. Mm -hmm. So that we not only just seeing them, we, we create this win-win situation so that we also uplift the economies of those, of those countries. And there are great potential of even improving infrastructure. We know some of, our, of the African countries have better soils than we do, but we have the technology in terms of seed development, we have technologies in terms of input utilization, and we can be able to translate that services into those countries so that we also build this partnership because we don't want to only see South Africa being uplifted in terms of their business communities. We also want to see those other um, uh, African state taking the, 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 the cue from South Africa and starting to build up their own community so that even their um, uh, citizens are developing and are educating, they are bridging the gap of development between the South Africa and other communities. And that will also require that those um, uh, countries also invest in some of the unknown tariff measures that inhibit for businesses to do and prosper effectively as we want it. But it's a very exciting time and we hopefully that it's only a start of the good things that will unfold. Yeah, and I suppose we would obviously uh, must hope and pray that we don't get go into tighter lockdown restrictions because I can imagine that, um, you know, it could obviously affect the trade. Uh, absolutely. And, and the problem with um, w once you start having these regional or continental value chain, you start having businesses investing in their business logistics and investing heavily on also on relationship and network to do these businesses. And with hard lockdown and border closures, what it, that does, not only it impact the short-term income of those businesses that are invested in such value chain, but it also have a medium to long-term impact of reviving consumer confidence in getting some of those commodities as you are. You will know very well as yourself, as a farmer and servicing some of the retailers that once your product is put in the shelf, consumers expect it to find it consistently. And once yeah. that value chain and supply chain is broken, it tends to be a mistrust on it. And restarting that and building again and investing on the consumer confidence tend to be a very big sunk cost. And that's one of the things that comes with some of the lockdown. As much as we do understand and we do emphasize the, the need of complying with health regulation, it's also important that they are done in the manner that put safeguards of protecting the very already fragile economies within the continent. Right. And how is South Africa doing in comparison to other African countries, especially from the agricultural landscape? Um, you could speak about many just different commodities, whether it's citrus, whether it's maize or field crops to be specific. How are we performing uh, in comparison to our African counterparts? I, I think we we're still performing relatively well. I think in the for, in the front of having proper systems in place, in and commercialization of our food system, and the sophistication part of it, and the value chain, as well as the cold chain for our perishable product. By far, I think we we still um, are leading the front on that part, uh, and also ensuring that we have a. a even though it might not necessarily be true for our small scale farmers in the country, but also having a much more efficient and established credit system, especially for the commercial and large farmers, I think we are doing relatively well in comparison with our farmers. And what that tends to do, it makes us really be a leader in some of the very sophisticated commodities, such as your fruits and beverages in terms of processing them into juice and other alcohol and non-alcoholic beverages. Similarly, also in your grains, whether you're looking at um, those that we have the environmental capability of, of producing them. And also the 
the adoption of technology, as you know, that in our grain system, we also ad adopted your GMOs varieties, which makes our yields much higher as compared with our, our counterparts in the rest of the continent. So in that front, I think we're doing relatively well. Mm. Where I think South Africa can take, take note and some of the examples from the rest of the continent is how do you also start integrating that with your smallholder farmers, especially in the substance farming and in the communal areas and bringing them in terms of providing this input and more importantly, the localization of input provision and localization of agro-processing so that you also create jobs at that down, at that uh, uh, elementary level of, of, of sector. And I think if you're looking at countries like Kenya, if you're looking at countries like even not as far as Kenya, even here, Zambia or other countries, we, they seem to have found some models. If you're looking at Kenya, the way they're doing in their nut industry as well as in the avocado industries, they, they have that integrated system that tends to work very well, which I think we can copy and be able to replicate that in South Africa. Similarly, we don't even have to go that far. Even in the animal industries, when you're looking at the countries like Namibia and how they really integrate that, even the system they have in terms of biosecurity measures to control them, I think it's one of the areas we can adopt so that we can uplift also our smallholder farming system in the country. Wow, coming back home, and I know that you are um, uh, someone who studied winemaking. How is the wine industry? <laughs> how is the wine industry able to uh, pick up uh, in the in this first quarter? Um, is there any steady um, progress in its operations? Um, maybe if you could just give us some insights as well, uh, uh, particularly with the wine industry. Very interesting, uh, and uh, um, I must be careful now. Uh, very, my, my very first meeting in tomorrow, we are engaging with the industry captain from the wine industry. Okay. <laughs> but I think it's one of the few industries that has really had a tough time since yeah. the, the corona started. And I think they continue to be back. I think let's start with the, with the rains that we spoke about in our opening podcast. Um, yeah. It's really a very unique season that they are facing even from the weather perspective, that they are delayed, um, which on its own, it's hopefully has, has that silver lining in terms of the large stock or stockpiling that they've had because they couldn't sell last year. And this delayed um, um, season in terms of harvesting has given them a slight window of breathing because of the storage facility that they were suffering with, that they couldn't move those grapes much quicker into their cellars because the tanks are still full with one. But in overall, I must emphasize that it's one of the industries that is still very much struggling in terms of how it, get, it, it could allocate some of those wine stock that they couldn't place them into the market because of the lockdown, which really has constrained their profitability and their cash flows level, which went on even in, uh, affecting the, 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 even the employees into that industry. But I think what is coming on also in the industries which they just to assist them also, at least in the short term, over and above the different uh, relief forms that can be uh, uh, created with the social partners, whether it's government and other um, players in the industry. It's also finding some alternative routes of how they can use this um, excess uh, wine that they have, whether they turn them into alcohol-based sanitizers, so that they find new business opportunities to use so that they can be able to sustain it. But in overall, we're hoping that the wine industry, with the economy starting to recover, they will also start being, um, those that in the downside start recovering. And I think in the short term measures, such as also either a, 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 a suspended or a delayed um, uh, uh, collection in some of the tax, taxes and other areas could assist them in the very short term with some of the cash flows and while they are trying to find their food. But it's an industry that is, that is significantly struggling mm -hmm. at the moment. And I think there are various discussion and talks as to say, how can it be assisted? Because it's such a critical industry, not only just for upliftment of those farming communities in the Western Cape and Northern Cape, but also it's a, one of the biggest generator of our foreign earnings and keeping them afloat will be in the interest of the country. Mm. If you're joining us tonight, this is the Farming Podcast brought to you by Private Property. And we have Sfison Dombello, who's the trade economist of the National Agricultural Marketing Council. And tonight's topic is all about the South African agricultural landscape, pretty much 
focusing on um, this first quarter of 2021. So if you catch the, if you missed the first part of our conversation, definitely this podcast will be live on our YouTube channel. But going back into our conversation, uh, please can you ask, um, please pose any comments or questions to Sfi so that you want to know um, and um, anything that you want him to clarify based on, you know, the wine industry, um, the African Free Trade Agreement, um, the, how the agricultural sector has performed from a GDP perspective in the first quarter. Um, we're happy to take some questions on tonight's um, um, show. Sfi, so going back um, to the, the a point that you mentioned about um, the wine industry having to struggle and, you know, um, and that you're seeing that in the next coming months or quarters, it's just going to be very tough for them to obviously get back into uh, business as normal or business as usual, making profits. Uh, let's talk about this recently launched government initiative to be funding farmers. Um, what is it about? What is the intention behind that? Which farmers is it uh, um, uh, targeting? And specifically, maybe in which commodities? Yes. So maybe let's start with the commodities. Um, so one of the commodities, the fund, and it's, it's a fund between the, 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 the government, well, it's all government entities, but between the National Department and the IDC, as we know, it's one of the financial institutions that is providing development in the, right. in, in, the, in, in, the, in the country. And I think it's focusing mainly on your high value export oriented also commodities such as your fruits, the nuts, um, and the, 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 and and also those niche products such as your berries, but also those that are very strong in terms of also interlinkages with the agroprocessing component, such as your poultry and other animal product and cotton, which is reviving its, its strength. So those are some of the commodities that is focusing on. But I do believe as well that if you have a very um, um, a viable and striving business, you can also be able to access that commodity. I don't think it will be that um street to that it doesn't look at other agricultural products when there are opportunities for that but in overall it's just focusing on agriculture and agro-processing related products and i think one of the things um, which we must really emphasize in Bali is that agriculture for some time now in terms of the finance development finance specifically has really been struggling we know the challenges that the land bank have faced and i think um, and uh, also the, the fiscal constraint that the government themselves has ha is having. So there's a need to start having such of some of the blended kind of instrument that can use what government has in terms of their grant funding and use some of the developmental soft loans. And how do you blend that so that farmers can have not so excessively priced or uh, costly interest? but also not um, uh, money that is not sustainable in their businesses. So I think that's more or less the idea behind it. And this is an idea that has been around for some time where they, different industry players have been promoting this blended and finance kind of system to say, you de-risk some of the issues that are faced by the farmers and you make it easier for them to access both grant and loan funding part of it. And I think these are some of the instruments that are now starting to come forth. And the reason for that is that farmers themselves have to be able to have access into affordable working capital. So they continue to produce and they can be able to uh, um, procure some of the farming equipment that they require. What remains a challenge, because this one is, as you see some of the criteria of that, that it's more focused on farmers that have already started putting their foot on the, onto the sector. So the farmers that want to take a next step into the commercialization part of it, or even upscale already what their commercial uh, commercial enterprises or operation have been. So it's really targeting those kind of farmers that you have. Of course, in terms of the entry of those farmers that wants to enter into the sector or that then have the financial strength to back it up or to be regarded, we're hoping that there will be some instrument that will also cater for that bottom of the pyramid uh, um, uh, section for farmers. But this one specifically that was launched is looking at those farmers that already have a list of foot into the sector and ensuring them how do you uplift them into the next level by affording them a much more affordable cap capital to continue farming uh, competitively and profitably. Right. And so where do farmers apply? Do they go directly to the Department of Agriculture or do they uh, contact the IDC in this case? 
so you 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 can be able to apply into the because there are different instruments and especially that we we always encourage farmers to also be associated with commodity association because then that's where they also have information in terms of how to go about building these business plans and the latest market trends and commodity trends in that community that you're operating in. Mm -hmm. And once you have all those information, you can be able to con contact the IDC directly and they're able to assist you in terms of this A to Z step of how to go about it. But also you can be able to contact your provincial um, offices as in agriculture as well as the national offices because th this is an integrated system that will all channel you into the right place and they are working hand in hand. And then you are able to also understand the detailed part of it to say which component in your business operation as you apply for it will be regarded as a loan component and which part of it will be regarded as a grant component and the overall net effect and the benefit that you'll be uh, achieving when you go with that um, option, rather than perhaps maybe going with a much more commercially orientated, um, fully com private uh, kind of setup on it. So those benefits and pros and cons of it, farmers can directly engage with either the department or with the with the IDC specifically. Wow, well, that's a positive. And I suppose in this uh, specific uh, launched funding by government, this is separate to um, the capital injection that uh, Land Bank is receiving, as we heard uh, from the Minister of Finance. Um, so this is definitely separate. So does this mean that farmers indeed can take advantage of this new government initiative and maybe also approach the land bank now that, you know, the government is assisting them with a bit of uh, recapitalization? Uh, absolutely, but you've put it so correctly. And, and I think it's also important to where, where we start seeing some positive um, uh, um, uh, indicators, we acknowledge them. I think the stabilization of the land bank in terms of the management and also hopefully that the, the board that has been instituted is starting to bring in that confidence in terms of governance and putting proce processes in place. And this are now, uh, 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 this capital injection by government, it also shows some confidence that at least government still consider land bank is the most critical institution for development of agricultural mm -hmm. sector. And we're hoping this will be much more positive result where farmers now can start going back into the land bank. Because as I said earlier, you still need land bank because it caters even the, 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 the acquiring of the land itself and actually getting into agriculture. So it has a much more unique and a critical role that the land bank have to say. Over and above that, I think some of the system that was launched by the by the Minister of Agriculture last year with the counterpart in the provinces as well, where they were also catering for the subsistence and the most vulnerable farmers. And I think paying into attention to those kind of programs as well, because that that those kind of system become and those funding, it becomes an instrument that creates a bigger pool where Land Bank and IDC through this recently launched fund in the long term can start looking at the bigger pool of farmers that can be uplifted into the next stage of commercialization and development into sex. So all three of these different financial and credit instruments are so critical because they, they nurture and they ensure that you nurture all different farmers and you protect them and you support them up until they are able to compete freely and fairly and they participate more meaningfully into our economic system. Wow. Thank you so much, Fiso, for your valuable insights today. I definitely learned a lot. Uh, in addition to what I already know, but you were able to give a different spin into, um, you know, what's been happening in the sector. And I'm quite positive as a farmer, you know, uh, with all these things that you're saying, uh, because again, I think from a farmer's perspective, you know, we're straight into our farms, focusing our, on our production on a daily basis, but it's always refreshing to get an overview of where the sector is going, the agricultural landscape, the positive impact in the economy, um, you know, what, what should we um, how should we should position ourselves in the next coming quarters, especially now that we're still in uh, lockdown and you know uh, living in a COVID world in a COVID world? But um, yeah, 
I thank you so much for your time this evening. And um, to any of you that are watching and listening tonight, um, I think we ended on a positive note with regards to the recently launched government's um, uh, funding, because I know we always get uh, questions and inquiries about where can I get funding, where can I get funding? And um, it's also a positive that, you know, um, Land Bank is one such bank that is also being assisted by government and is being noticed by government to, um, to help uh, participate particularly black farmers or emerging farmers um, as the term that is almost always used. But mm. yes, Fisa, thank you so much for your time this evening and good luck for your meeting tomorrow. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you for the invite once again. And I really appreciate the chat. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. That's it. And we were in conversation with Swison Dombela, who's the trade economist of the NAMC. Once again, you will catch this interview or this conversation rather um, on our YouTube channel under the Private Property Farming Podcast playlist uh, on the Private Property YouTube channel. Um, again, if you missed it, that's where you'll find the video. Um, and um, if you have any questions that you want to ask us, please feel free to, to ask on the YouTube channel and we'll definitely respond accordingly. But thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, it's a wet night in Johannesburg for myself. So from wherever you're joining across the country, I wish you a good night and um, God bless. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you.